Hi, my name is Sam Slotnick, and today I'm going to tell you about how juvenile leaf-footed bugs are attracted to conspecific feeding sites. First, I would like to thank our many research assistants and lab mates, as well as our funding sources. I also wanted to acknowledge that we carried out this research on the stolen land of many peoples, including the Timucua and Seminole peoples. Furthermore, as a land-grant university, our research institution has also financially benefited from land thefts across the continent. Now to start, we know that in specialist feeding animals, intraspecific competition can be fierce and often drives behavioral strategies for maximizing feeding and mating success. For example, hummingbirds will sometimes fight each other for control over territories with nectar-filled flowers. Of course, there are both costs and benefits of staying near conspecifics, even for specialist feeders. Despite the high cost of competition for food and other resources, there are benefits as well, such as increased chances of finding food and mates, decreased predation risk due to group vigilance, and in highly social species, individuals may even gain feeding benefits via cooperative feeding and parental or alloparental care. But one potential benefit that hasn't been well studied is feeding facilitation by conspecifics. Here we aren't referring to mutually beneficial behaviors like cooperation or parental care, but rather a more commensal relationship. We hypothesize that specialist feeding animals may benefit from feeding close to conspecifics if their neighbors do the hard work of accessing food, but then get satiated before consuming all available nutrients. This would leave that food source available for another individual to feed on more easily and therefore provide benefits in the form of food access. One example of feeding facilitation can be found in this leaf-footed bug that is a conifer seed specialist. In the image on the right, you can see the interior of a pine nut that has been fed on by two bugs. The seed inside is all shriveled up due to the extensive feeding, but there's only one feeding site where the first bug drilled its piercing sucking mouth parts, called its rostrum, down through the hard pine nut shell. The second bug then took advantage of that hole that had already been created to feed more easily through this barrier. Despite examples like this one, feeding facilitation has not been well studied in specialist feeding animals. We set out to investigate whether feeding facilitation could overcome the cost of competition to promote conspecific attraction in specialist feeding animals. In particular, we decided to focus on the behavior of juvenile animals as juveniles are still growing and developing their feeding morphology, which means that there are likely poorer competitors when compared to adults, but also staying to stand to gain the most from feeding facilitation. Now for our study, we focused on a different species of leaf-footed bug, Narnia femorata. These bugs specialize on eating the fruit of prickly pear cactus in the genus Apuntia. Both adults and juveniles use their long thin rostrum to pierce the fruit skin and feed on the pulp and seeds deep inside. In the image on the right, I have highlighted the length of the rostrum of an adult and juvenile bug called a nymph. While the nymph has a long rostrum relative to its body size, its rostrum is much shorter than that of the adult, putting it at a disadvantage when it comes to feeding on cactus fruits, since rostrum length determines the maximum depth of penetration into the fruit. So our overall question was whether juvenile Narnia femorata take advantage of feeding facilitation by conspecifics. We broke this question down into a series of smaller questions that we could answer by running simple behavioral experiments. First, we asked if nymphs often feed on the same fruit as other bugs. To answer this question, we set up an arena in which bugs could move around and feed freely. The arena was divided into 30 grid cells with one cactus fruit in each cell and 22 adult bugs inside. During each day of the 17 day study, we added 10 nymphs in the morning and removed them in the evening. Throughout the study, we recorded how many nymphs and adults were in each grid cell at 10 time points throughout the day. This figure shows the number of adults and nymphs in each grid cell at the first observation point on day one. The adults are shown in blue and the nymphs are shown in orange. At this time, there are two nymphs feeding socially, by which I mean that they were feeding on the same fruit as a conspecific. And simultaneously, there were five nymphs feeding alone. Now I'll show you how the bugs moved around throughout the rest of day one. You will notice that there are usually some nymphs feeding socially and some feeding alone, and there were always quite a few open fruits that had no bugs on them at all. Now that was just day one out of the 17 day study. 
If we count the number of NIMS feeding socially and subtract the number of NIMS feeding alone at all 170 time points, we can get an idea of how often overall the NIMS are feeding socially versus alone. Here I will show a histogram of these differences with positive values indicating more NIMS for feeding socially and negative values indicating that more NIMS for feeding alone. We can see that the peak of the histogram is right around zero, indicating that in general, similar numbers of NIMS for feeding socially as we're feeding alone. And if we calculate the mean of these differences, we find that on average, there are around 0.5 more NIMS feeding socially as feeding alone at any given time. And as I mentioned before, the NIMS that fed socially weren't doing it due to a scarcity of fruits. On average, there were 23 fruits available with no bugs feeding on them at any given time. So if the NIMS were highly motivated to avoid competitors, or even if they were just choosing fruits at random, we would likely have seen far more NIMS feeding alone since there were so many opportunities to do so. So to answer our first question, yes, the NIMS do often feed on the same fruit as other bugs, even when plenty of other fruits are available to feed on. Next, we asked if NIMS are actually attracted to fruit that has been previously fed on by conspecifics. To test the NIMS attraction to fruits that had been previously fed on, we collected 50 fallen cactus fruits and size matched them into 25 pairs. Within each pair, one fruit was fed on by an adult bug for one week while the other fruit was not. Then we placed each pair of fruits into a cup and drew a line down the middle. We put one nymph into each cup and recorded its location within the cup every 10 minutes for 10 hours a day, three days in a row. This figure will show the results of this experiment with the y-axis depicting the difference between the number of observations on the fruit that had been fed on minus the number of observations on the control fruit. So any values above zero indicate a preference for the fruit with adult feeding cues. Here are the means with bootstrap 95% confidence intervals for all three days together, as well as broken down into days one, two, and three. As you can see, all the means are at or above zero, and overall, the NIMS showed a statistically significant preference for standing on or near the adult fed fruit over the control fruit. Next, we decided to replicate this experiment with fruit that had been fed on by NIMS rather with, than with adult bugs. Here we saw similar results. There was a statistically significant preference for feeding on and standing on the nymph-fed fruit on day one, although this preference did decline on days two and three. Therefore, overall, our answer once again is yes, the nymphs are attracted to fruit that had been previously fed on by conspecifics, both adult and juvenile conspecifics. Lastly, we asked if nymphs seek out and feed in the exact same site as a conspecific previously fed. They, this would give us really good evidence that they are taking advantage of feeding facilitation. To test this, we allowed adult bugs to feed on a cactus fruit for an hour, then removed the bug and marked its feeding site. We also added a second mark on a different part of the fruit to act as a control. Then we placed a nymph on the fruit and recorded where it chose to feed. Overall, we recorded 30 total feeding observations from the nymphs. Two observations were in the marked feeding sites, two were in the marked control sites, and the rest were in other locations outside of the marks. Therefore, the nymphs do not preferentially feed in the same sites as adults have previously fed. So this study revealed no evidence of feeding facilitation, meaning that the conspecific attraction behavior of the nymphs is likely due to other factors. So the answer to our third question is no. The nymphs do not feed in the same sites as conspecifics previously fed, even when those feeding sites are available to them. In conclusion, we can say that juveniles of specialist feeding animals may use conspecific attraction during feeding to enhance their growth and survival. But for Narnia femorata, this conspecific attraction behavior is likely not due to feeding facilitation. Instead, conspecific attraction may provide other benefits, such as help in avoiding predation, finding high quality fruits, etc. Thank you for attending my presentation. I would be happy to answer any questions.